Let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. To Hebrews, chapter 5. Hebrews 5. And uh, let's read the first six verses today. Hebrews 5 and verses 1 through 6. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, uh, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to <laughs> offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, as he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. The writer, who we believe is Paul, uh, he's returning to the theme of chapter 3, verse 1, where he called Christ Jesus the Apostle, and high priest of our profession. And he's going to point out Christ's superiority to the Levitical priesthood uh, in yet another way. He's already discussed Christ's superiority to Moses, who was a son of Levi, uh, according to Exodus chapter 2, uh, back in chapter 3 and verses 3 through 6 when we were there. And that he was superior to any uh, Levite priest, um, because he didn't sin at all, Hebrews 4.15. Unlike the priests of, uh, among men, Christ had no sins that needed to be forgiven, and therefore needed to be atoned for. And now he's about to point out that in type, Christ's priesthood preceded that of the Levites. And uh, it was so broad in scope as to include both Jews and Gentiles. And the way he's going to prove this is by likening the Lord Jesus Christ to a Gentile priest named Melchizedek. And uh, verse 1 here says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Well, that's apparent throughout the scriptures. Noah, as the high priest of his family, offered sacrifices to God. We read Genesis 8, verse 20. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Abraham, <coughs> excuse me, as the high priest of his family, did the same. Genesis 12, verse 8, near the town of Bethel, we read, and there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Likewise, Job, who was worried about the possible sins of his children, um, and it says, he offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually, Job 1, verse 5. But sacrifices are negative. A sacrifice implies you having to give up something that you'd rather not part with, but you do so even grudgingly sometimes. You do so anyway. A gift, however, is positive. Gifts under the Levitical priesthood, they come under the, the heading of free will offerings. Free will offerings. Go back, if you will, to Numbers chapter 15. Numbers 15. And let's read the first four verses there. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, when ye be come into the land of your habitations, which I give unto you, and will make an offering by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering, or a sacrifice in performing a vow, or in a free will offering, 
or in your solemn feasts to make a sweet savor unto the Lord of the, of the herd or of the flock, then shall he that offereth his offering unto the Lord bring a meat offering of a tenth deal of flour, made with the fourth part of a hen of oil, and so forth and so on. Um, although a free will offering was brought by the, the, the voluntary act of the person, God still said there was a proper way uh, in which to bring it. Um, in addition to the burnt offerings and the peace offerings and the sin offerings, etc., which are mentioned throughout the books of Moses. And there's a companion expression called tithes and offerings in, in the book of Malachi 3, verse 8. Will the man rob God? And he says, Yet ye have robbed me, and they and ye shall say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Well, the tithes were commanded, the offerings would be voluntary. And verse 2 of our text, Who can have compassion on the ignorant, and on them that are out of the way? Turn, if you will, back again to the book of Leviticus, chapter 4. Leviticus 4 and verse 2 says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord, concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them, and also chapter <laughs> 5, verse 17, And if a soul sin, and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done uh, by the commandments of the Lord, though he be though he wist not, wist it not, yet is he guilty, and shall bear his iniquity. So the ignorant doesn't mean. Uh, that the person didn't know right from wrong. But it means he hadn't been instructed in the specific commandments of God concerning such things. And they were still, that person was still guilty. God has, however, made uh, allowances for certain categories. And I'll give you the references, but we won't turn to all of them. Uh, in the case of self-defense. Luke chapter 22 Verses 36 through 38. There the Lord Jesus told his disciples to buy a sword. They said, we have two swords. Yeah, that's plenty. By the way, for any of you getting sneaky ideas here watching us online, we have several guys in our church who are packing. <laughs> and they pack every Sunday. There's just too many weirdos out in the world there that want to come into church. And God help the weirdo that comes to this church. Uh, also for the category of manslaughter, that's unintentional killing. Numbers 35, verses 22 to 25. And for national defense, 1 Samuel 15, verses 1 to 3. There God told King Saul to uh, assemble the people and go to war against the Amalekites. Because as payback for their past uh, ambushments against Israel as Israel was coming out of Egypt and the Amalekites came to uh, prevent them from coming through their land. God said, when you get into your land, I want you to go wipe them out. Well, God was thorough. He said, don't just wipe the men out. Wipe the women, the children, every animal. Kill them all. You don't want to be on God's bad side. That's, that's one thing I guess you need to take away. I don't want to be on the Lord's bad side. He knows how to deal with you. But uh, you were permitted um, such things that didn't make you automatically guilty for taking up arms in the defense of your country uh, as directed to do so or to protect your home and your family and your property. Uh, Romans chapter 2, about verse 15, says, For when the Gentile, which have not the law, 
do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. Their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Even if a guy has never read the Bible, he's never had the Bible preached to him, there's a certain instinct every man has about what's right and what's wrong. You know it's wrong to steal what doesn't belong to you. You know it's wrong to kill someone that's an innocent and helpless victim. You know it's right to execute a murderer. Just as um, knowing what's right and wrong uh, makes you guilty for doing it simply by knowing that it was wrong to do, not doing what is right, I would say, makes you equally guilty. If you do not put the murderer to death as punishment for his crime mur of murder, then, then you or society is equally guilty as the guy who killed when he knew he shouldn't kill. Amen. That's why this country is headed for hell. Yep. Oh, I know we like current President Trump and I like certain things the government's doing, but this country is on a fast track to hell right now. And it's been for a long time. You know, if you were to fix this country, you'd have to shut, first of all, shut down every abortion clinic, and you'd have to put the abortion doctors to death as murderers. You'd go through the prisons, you'd clear out every jail cell where there's a capital offender there who was put on death row, and he'd been sitting there eating three squares a day for 20 years, Amen. and by the time right get, they get around to executing him, everybody uh, involved has died, or they've forgotten about the crime, and the, the severity of it doesn't have any effect anymore. You kill the guy as soon as you convict him right after the crime while it's fresh in everybody's minds. Yep. That's the only way that it will have the effect on society at, whole, at large that it's supposed to have. Don't let him sit there. I don't want to pay for that guy's, uh, you know, three meals and health care and everything else. Yeah. I don't want to pay for him to go to take online courses in prison yeah. and work out with weights, you know. I want him dead. Yep. I want him dead. Do you know something? If this country were to go, through, say, if, and I said this before, and don't anyone take this the wrong way. I'm just, this is all tongue in cheek. George Putnam used to say, what this country needs is a good dictator for about 10 months. He doesn't have to answer to Congress. He can do what needs to be done and get everything running smoothly again. And then once everything's back on track, off with his head. <laughs> <laughs> That's about the only way you could do it. And um, yeah, I, don't want, I don't want that guy getting fat on the public dime. I want him dead. Yeah. Say, man, you're a hard nose. You better believe it. <clears throat> don't get me. There's other subjects I could be just as graphic about and explicit about, but we won't go into those today. But um, he says, verse 2, them that are out of the way in our text. Uh, that being a a reference to the way of righteousness. And that's a prominent theme throughout the Bible, the way of righteousness, especially in the book of Proverbs. Look at Hebrews 12 and verse 13. Hebrews 12, well, verses 12 and 13. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. But uh, the Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 16, 25. Uh, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Psalm 23, 3 tells us. Go back, if you will, to the book of Psalms, Psalm 5. And I'm going to try to move along for time's sake today, so I apologize if I'm a little too fast. Psalm 5, and notice one verse there, verse 8. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of my enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. And that has to do with living right, doing right. 
That's what we call uh, fruit of righteousness. After you become a Christian, you're no longer a, a, a hell-raising, uh, perverted, cussing, swearing uh, dude like you used to be. Suddenly, something takes over you by the Holy Ghost. It begins to make you sweet and mellow and kind and a better father, a better mother, a better worker at, at work, a better boss if you want a company, uh, and more compassion to people you run into all the time. That is the, the, the ultimate, the eventual fruit of righteousness. You, you no longer want to cut corners. You're honest on your income tax form. <clears throat> and, um, and you no longer take things that don't belong to you. You don't, no longer, you know, parking your car in a handicapped spot when you're not handicapped, right? Amazing, these people. They want that spot right up front because it's marked in blue for handicapped cars. Then they go inside Walmart and they walk for three miles anyway, so what's the, what's the big deal? But uh, everything about you begins to change, little by little. Everyone grows as a Christian at a different rate of speed, but little by little things become different about you and the way you face the world and look at the world and approach the world. And those who are out of the way are those who are not seeking to do right and to live right. And then verse 2 again in our text, for that he himself, the priest, also is compassed with infirmity. The reason God picked human priests in the Old Testament is because they had problems too, and they could relate to the congregation, and they could identify with them and uh, be sympathetic and empathetic. Paul states this, look back at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians 1, and notice the first four verses here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, out of the church of God, which is at Corinth, and all the saints which are in all Achaia, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, notice verse 4, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. The only way you can truly um, empathize with somebody else is if you understand their plight, because you're human too. You have problems too. And... Um, if your fellow man is stumbling and and uh, not doing right, he's going the wrong way, then a human priest is supposed to be able to identify with him because he has problems as well. Uh, he's able to understand his situation. And for this reason, one of the requirements of a uh, pastor, not a Roman Catholic priest, but a pastor, is that he's supposed to be married. An, un an unmarried Catholic priest uh, cannot identify with a thousand problems that come up uh, being uh, trying to raise children or take care of a wife. That's right. As a matter of fact, one of the, I, work for, I work in the funeral business during the week. And uh, the biggest constituency of, of uh, families we serve are probably Roman Catholics. So I'm going to... Uh, almost one, at least one Mass every week, right? Funeral Mass. And they start the, the funeral the same way, reading those scriptures uh, that, that because God has comforted us, we can comfort those who are in any trouble by the same consolation we have received from Him. And um, a guy who has no way of identifying with a real, uh, real life problems is reading scriptures that tell him he's supposed to be able to. That's comical, you ask me. But now if he's single, he won't understand all of those things. Um, and you can read 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 8, about all the qualifications for a pastor, uh, and then deacons as well. Christ had to be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, Isaiah 53, 3. 
uh, in order to be our high priest. And he was born like a man, he lived like a man, he walked among men, and therefore he can identify with men, but um, wonderfully, because he was not a man, he had no sins that needed to be forgiven. Um, verse 3 in our text, or I should say he was more than a man, verse 3 in our text, and by reason hereof, he, that's a human priest, he ought, as for the people, so also to offer, to, uh, excuse me, to also for himself to offer for sins. Unlike the Levitical priests, uh, Christ didn't need to make a sacrifice for his own sins because he didn't have any. Hebrews 4.15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And the idea of a Catholic priesthood is to drag Christians back into some Old Testament type system where the death of Christ is completely irrelevant and means just about nothing. Because they're going to drag you back uh, under their system of required sacrifices. And, um, and I heard a preacher years ago say, if Christ's death wasn't all sufficient once and for all, it will never be all sufficient, no matter how many times you keep repeating it. And um, just as I came up with a good question to deal with Mormons, as we mentioned in our sermon time, if you understand what someone else believes, <clears throat> then with the work of the Holy Spirit, and just by using a little common sense, you can then begin making inroads and pick it apart. They, uh, how many of you, by any chance, by, just by uh, curious, how many of you were Roman Catholic before you trusted Christ? One there, one there, my wife, and Brother Manuel, he went out, but how many of you want to be? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but the Catholic Church says that when the priest holds up the bread and the wine, he says the words of consecration over it, and they become the body the literal body and the literal blood of Jesus. And it just conveniently tastes like bread and tastes like wine. Uh, that's to get you to swallow it. Because if it was real flesh, who wants to stick that in their mouth, right? Mm -hmm. but, they, but they play this little mind game. They tell themselves that that's the body and blood of Christ. And in the Mass, they say, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. He gave you thanks and praise, gave it to the site, blessed it, gave it to his disciples, and so forth. So they... They say that what Jesus, what the priest is doing is a repetition of what the, Jesus did with the disciples the night before he, cruci he was crucified. Everybody with me so far? Mm -hmm. And uh, the way you need to talk to a Catholic then is to say, so that means that the first time Jesus' body and blood were offered as a sacrifice for sins was not on the cross of Calvary, but it was actually on the table the night before, because in the sec uh, in the uh, Council of Trent, they said uh, that uh, the bread and wine contain the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of Christ. The entire Christ is contained in those elements. So that means the first time Jesus' body and blood were actually offered for sins and sinners was on the table with the disciples the night before Calvary. And if and if you can get a Catholic to follow you that far into the into the discussion, then you say, well now, if that's so, why did Jesus go out physically and die on a cross the next day? What was the purpose of that? Because as far as I can tell, God doesn't do anything for naught. He has a reason. He has a purpose for everything he does. So what was the purpose of that? Now, if a Catholic says, well, maybe the night before were simply symbols of what he was going to do the there next you go. day. There you go. Now you've got them. There you go. Because they say in the Mass, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And they, they are recalling the, the upper room with the disciples as the, the paradigm, the precursor of every, every sacrifice the priest is doing since that time. And if that one 
was a symbol, that means all the others are simply symbolic as well. They're not literal. And um, like this Mormon fellow I was telling you about a couple weeks ago, it's kind of fun in a way to lead somebody into the, into your trap, right? Then you close the door behind him. <laughs> you can, this is like this guy, he, was, he had no idea what to do when I was quoting the scripture to him that he was trying to refer me to. He didn't know it. They're not taught to memorize scripture. By the way, the more ignorant people are of the Bible, the less effort it takes for you to appear as a Bible scholar. You're talking to your friends at work um, about how rotten things are and how awful the government is and how much decline the country is. You say, well, the Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God, Psalm 917. Just quote that one verse and cite the chapter and verse. That's all you have to do. Because they're so woefully ignorant of the Bible, they don't know one, one end of the Bible from the other. All you have to do is cite one chapter, one verse, and quote the verse verbatim. might be the only verse you know. But if you use it at the right moment, at the right time, that person's going to think, man, this guy's really studied. He's a Bible scholar. How did a guy tell me that? And say, man, this guy's a scholar. It was nothing. I hadn't gone to Bible school. I was just reading my Bible every day, and, and it just kind of blurted out in conversation, things like that. And he thought I was the, the smartest guy he'd ever met in the Bible. And that's, like I say, winning with deception and bluff. But uh, <laughs> verse 4. Uh, verse 4 in our text said, No man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. No man can decide, I'm going to become a Roman Catholic priest because I saw an ad in Playboy magazine which uh, was appealing to young men to join the priesthood. And there was just such an ad in 1983. Hundreds of young men responded to it. That's where they get their priests from. It's kind of like uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Yeah. <laughs> but um, there are no Catholic priests in the Bible. Um, in the New Testament, every believer is part of the God's priesthood. And in the New Testament, uh, we offer to God spiritual sacrifices, not literal fleshly ones uh, like the, the life of an animal. Our bodies are to be yielded to God, according to Romans 12, and our sacrifices are sacrifices of thanks and praise. Look uh, forward at Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13, verse 15, Hebrews 13, 15, by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And go forward uh, just a few more pages to 1 Peter, chapter 2. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. In verse 9 there. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Go back, if you will, to the book of Hosea. Hosea. Hosea 14. That's right before Hosea 15. Or right after Hosea 13. Hosea 14. And here's that, that verse in type, or at least a precursor in the Old Testament, Hosea 14, verse 2. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. 
So you and I don't offer literal flesh and blood sacrifices. <coughs> the only sacrifice that, that pertains to us was offered by Christ on the cross of Calvary. And um, once he's done it all, there's nothing left for you to do except to accept it and then live a life of, thank, uh, of thanks and praise and gratitude to him. Amen. And uh, a lot of Christians aren't even doing that. Back to our text, verse 5, it says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest. Although that's where he in, eventually ended up and wound up as the apostle and high priest of our profession, chapter 3, verse 1. But this was only after God had exalted him. And it says, But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, verse 5, was the same one who would later say, Thou art a priest, verse 6. Notice the difference between a Roman Catholic, a Roman Catholicism, I should say, and New Testament Christianity. They have archbishops. We have one bishop. That's Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 2, verse 25. Our bishop, our, rather, our bishops are called elders and pastors. Theirs are called priests. Their highest priest is a pope. Our high priest is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Hebrews 3, verse 1. Our prince of apostles is Jesus Christ. Their prince of apostles is Satan. Matthew 16, verses 22 and 23. And Peter said, Be it not so, Lord, Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things of God, but the, the things that be of, which be of man. Their rock is not as our rock, and um, ours is Jesus Christ himself. Amen. I'll have you run to a couple of quick places. Deuteronomy 32. I realize we bounce around a lot and go from scripture to scripture, but this is the only way you can learn it. You have to compare verses with verses and uh, let them render the final conclusion themselves. Deuteronomy 32 and uh, let's see here. Verse uh, 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. And then verse 31. For their rock is not as our rock even our enemies themselves being judges. You ever talk to a, uh, let's say a Mexican family, a sweet little Mexican lady, and uh, you're trying to pass out tracts? They can offer you a tract. Oh, no, no, I'm a Catholic. <laughs> they seem to know there's a difference between Catholics and Christians. Mm -hmm. I have a, a lady I met recently, and she's a Vietnamese. She's a Roman Catholic. But she knows there's a difference between Catholics and Christians. Now, you talk to the priests, and they'll tell you, well, we're Christians too. In fact, we're the original Christians. But your people don't seem to know that. They seem to know there's a great distinction between a Roman Catholic whose devotion is to the church and a Christian whose devotion is to the Bible. You know, I've said this before. Right? It bears repeating. God didn't give us priests with special Halloween costumes. When you go to a Catholic church, a Catholic mass, doesn't matter what kind of mass it is, it's all a theatrical performance. The priest has his costume. Uh, he's reading out of the script. The altar boys, they're the, sort of the extras on the set. The music and the stained glass windows and the statues and the images and the incense and the candles, all of those are special effects. All of this is a theatrical production. And, uh, and, in fact, they, they process in from the back of the church at the start of Mass, like uh, someone coming onto the stage to do a concert. It's all a theatrical show. And it's sad that so many people can't see it for what it plainly is. And uh, he's not going to have you open your Bibles and teach you the Scriptures. He doesn't know the Scriptures, or why? how could he teach it to you? So their 
Third Rock is not like our rock. Go to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. Matthew 7. I'm going to try to hurry along here. It's almost uh, time for our lunch. By the way, those of you watching on the internet, uh, we have lunch every week together here at church. So I'm getting hungry and I'm going to try to move along. For that <laughs> Matthew chapter 7. Notice one verse there, Jesus said, verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rock is Jesus Christ. Amen. The rock is not Simon Peter. Uh, doesn't the Bible say, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. Well, if Jesus Christ was the same God who appeared in the Old Testament, and that Lord God was the rock of Israel, then Jesus Christ is the rock of a believer. Amen. Amen. Peter represents um, the, the, the fool who built his house upon the sand. If you study the lives of the popes, you will see there's nothing but shifting sand. There's nothing you can anchor your, yourself to or anchor your, your uh, soul to or your religion to. So... Their priest uh, is not like our priest. Their rock is not like our rock. And then verse 6, uh, as he saith also in another place, uh, Thou art a priest forever. God the Father ordained Jesus Christ to be a priest. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek didn't offer any flesh of an animal either. He offered just bread and wine. Uh, as an offering to God when Abraham uh, encountered him. And he was no Catholic priest either. Hebrews chapter 7, look over there, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Melchizedek is a, a dark horse. He's an enigma. He's a mystery in the scriptures. You can read about him mentioned in later in the book of Hebrews when we get to it. And he's mentioned briefly in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, and then disappears. You don't hear from him again until he's mentioned again here in the book of Hebrews. But you can read those verses and know just about as little about them as you did before you read the verses. Some have proposed that, because it says there in verse uh, 3 of chapter 7, without father, without mother, without descent, well, descent would be he had no children after him, that this was Jesus Christ appearing in the Old Testament, a little pre early appearance of Christ. But uh, I would disagree with that because the rest of the verse says, but made like unto the Son of God. So he wasn't the Son of God in some um, you know, preview, coming attractions of Christ. But uh, whatever or whoever he was, he was a certain, a certain great type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he was not a Jewish priest because when he encountered uh, Abraham, there were no Jews yet. The Jews descended uh, from the sons of uh, Jacob, the 12 tribes. So there were no Jews yet. He was undoubtedly a, uh, what we call a Gentile. And uh, he's a mystery. He's a very enigmatic person in the scriptures that little is known about. But we'll get to him in more detail next week, but he was a priest that Abraham gave tithes to. This was how unique Melchizedek was. Don't let any kid with a white shirt and a necktie and a bicycle tell you he's got the Melchizedek priesthood. That's a lot of crap. Some kid that's 17 years old has got a name tag that says elder. 
I want to get one. I want to go to a trophy shop and have them make me one. It looks just like the LDS uh, name tags and Mike's driving younger. <laughs> I just walk around town and wear it and see if anybody notices. You know? 